I'm Kenitra Brown. You're good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Pandemic Policy Project presentations. It's being presented by Professor Cynthia Alcon on constitutional issues concerning plea bargains during COVID-19. We're so excited to have her here. Thank you so much and we hope you enjoy. I'll let Professor Alcon introduce herself and start her presentation. So I am uh, Cynthia Alcon. I, as you can see from the uh, slide, I'm a professor of law and I direct the criminal law justice and policy program at Texas A&M University, which is here in Fort Worth at the law school. Um, my background, I was a public defender in Los Angeles for many years, um, and then I worked abroad for many years doing criminal legal reform um, in a number of uh, post-communist, post-Soviet countries, uh, and have since worked in a few other countries um, along the way um, that aren't in that, kind of in the post-Soviet orbit, um, post-communist orbit. Um, and I've been teaching for a number of years. I teach uh, criminal law, I teach negotiation, I teach advanced criminal procedure. Um, and my area of scholarship uh, focuses very much on uh, the plea bargaining and uh, dispute resolution in a criminal context. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today and plea bargaining is uh, something I love talking about. I could go on forever, so I'm really going to try and keep it um, focused on what I think are the basics that you should be aware of, um, both in general um, and also as you are um, looking for materials for this um, wonderful and incredibly ambitious project uh, that's going on here. Um, so first off, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, um, the uh, plea bargaining is the dominant way in which we resolve criminal cases in this country. Um, that was recognized by the Supreme Court in Lafler v. Cooper only in 2012, although it had been the dominant process for decades before, um, when they said criminal justice today is for the most part a system of pleas, not a system of trials. Um, so here are the basic statistics. Um, 92 to 97 percent of criminal cases are resolved through plea bargaining. Um, this has existed since colonial times. It was the dominant process, which means well over 50% of cases were being resolved by, through plea bargaining by the middle of the last century. So by the 1950s, 60s, this was the dominant way in which all uh, criminal cases were being resolved. So there's nothing new um, here in terms of our use and our um, reliance on plea bargaining to resolve criminal cases. However, I think it's important to also recognize that it's not uniform across the board. So it's not that it's 92 to 97 percent of all cases. Um, much less serious cases plead out at much higher rates. So, for example, I have 10 years worth of data from Tarrant County, which is where Fort Worth sits. Um, it's a um, medium sized county, it's about 800,000 people in Fort Worth. Um, so medium large probably is where it sits. Um, 800,000 people in the county of Tarrant County. Um, and for this 10 year period, 100% of the felony drug cases pled out. There was not a single felony drug case trial in Tarrant County over a 10 year period. Um, and this is not unusual. With less serious cases like misdemeanors, you see very high plea rates. Uh, with the less serious types of felonies, which is where drug cases will sit, uh, you'll see much higher plea rates. When you get to more serious cases, that's when the plea rates will go down. So for example, in Texas on any given year, um, it'll be plus or minus about 45% of the capital murder cases will plead out and the rest are going to trial. Um, so it's not uniform across the board that 92 to 97% of all types of cases are pleading out, but overall, that's where it sits. Um, so some basics, right? So we're all talking about the same thing. So plea bargaining is an informal negotiation between the prosecutor um, and the defense to resolve the criminal case. Um, there is absolutely no right to a plea bargain. It is entirely within the discretion of the prosecution. There's also an ability to plead open to the judge, um, but it means pleading to whatever charges the prosecutor has filed. Um, and that tends to be less of a negotiation. Um, but that doesn't mean that every uh, plea negotiation between prosecution and defense is very long. Sometimes it's just a simple prosecutor says this is the offer. Certain types of cases and in you know, counties across the country, there's standard offers for standard cases. So uh, driving under the influence or driving while intoxicated, uh, these are pretty standard cases. You'll have standard deals for them. Uh, and the negotiation is often just 
same with the what everyone recognizes to be the standard deal and the defense accepting or not and there isn't much conversation uh there can be a lot more conversation and i know i've been involved in plea negotiations that went over weeks as information was being exchanged and as the case was more complicated there were things the prosecutor needed to check before coming back to me as the defense lawyer um, and being able to talk about what they were or weren't able to do so uh the judge has to accept the plea deal uh, it is fairly uncommon that they don't, but it is something that the parties need to take into account in negotiating plea deals, uh, that the judge does need to accept it. There are three basic types of plea bargains. So the first is charge bargaining. So that's if someone is charged with possession for sale um, of a controlled substance, the defense lawyer may come back and say, well, what about making it a simple possession? Um, so that would be charge bargaining, reducing it to a different charge or taking out charges. So often a variety of charges are filed and the agreement may be to plead just to one of the, of the filed charges. The second is sentence bargaining. So that's where um, the question is how much time is someone going to do in jail or in prison? Is it going to be a probation sentence or is it not going to be a probation sentence? This is um, sentence bargaining. There can also be bargaining about how much is a fine going to be if it's not required by statute. Um, and restitution amounts, things like that. These are all um, open for bargaining as long as they're not um, mandated by law uh, to be a certain minimum. And even then there can be um, wiggle room depending on you know what charge and whatnot, which leads to you know, the reality that uh, a lot of plea bargains are not just charge bargaining or sentence bargaining, but they're both. So both types of negotiation are going on. The third is something that tends to happen more in the federal system, and this is a sentencing recommendation agreement where the prosecutor says we'll recommend X sentence um, for the defendant um, if they plead guilty, um, but it's not um, locked in, right? The judge still can decide what to do. Okay, so where is the law on plea bargaining? Uh, there's not much. Um, so every state has some sort of law with a focus on plea bargaining, but it tends to be more about how the plea is taken in court, um, which is also what um, Rule 11 in the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure does. And these are basically based on the, a lot of the state laws I think are really just Rule 11. Um, so it's what rights does the defendant need to waive? How is it going to be done? Um, and if any of you have ever seen a plea taken in court, it's a pretty standard thing. The judge basically has a script they're reading off of, and the script is coming out of these laws. So it has to do with the plea being taken in court, not the process by which a plea happens. So the laws on the books are entirely silent on what happens in the negotiation, what's legitimate or not in terms of what the prosecutor might be doing in the negotiation process and same with the defense. Um, so there are Supreme Court cases on plea bargaining, given that it's been around since colonial times and that it is the dominant way in which we resolve uh, criminal cases. Uh, it's surprising how little there is. There's much more, uh, Supreme Court case law on death penalty cases, for example, which are a much smaller percentage of, excuse me, overall of the cases that go through uh, the court system. Um, so um, the, um, the cases that have been decided really started with Brady v. U.S. in 1970, which is, I said at the beginning, right, plea bargaining was always already the dominant process by 1970. Um, and the court basically in that case uh, said it's okay to plea bargain. It's not violating the constitution to have a plea negotiation. Um, so what are the basic rules? A guilty plea must be voluntary, knowing, and intelligent. Uh, there is very little definition of what that means. And there are huge questions about what is in fact voluntary, what is in fact knowing, and what is in fact intelligent. But there's very little case law to give you any uh, definition uh, to what, the, what that means and what would or wouldn't qualify. The case law that's out there is, um, at least from a defense point of view, not particularly helpful. Um, so Brady, the case that said that uh, plea bargaining is constitutional, um, said it's not coercion if the defendant agrees to accept a plea deal um, to avoid the death penalty. And their reasoning there was death penalty is a completely legal uh, penalty. So if the defendant is deciding that they would rather spend their life in prison than be faced with death, that's a knowing and intelligent 
decision and it's not putting undue pressure on the defendant is is not coercion um, and it's just fine um, the court has also held it doesn't violate the due process clause if the prosecutor threatens to reindict with more serious charges if the defendant refuses the plea deal um, so uh, and this is something that is not unusual at all um, adding uh, threatening to reindict or threatening just simply to add charges in jurisdictions that make it a lot simpler for prosecutors to add charges along the way um, and oftentimes if you've got things like enhancements for um, prior offenses or if it's something that happened in the school zone or it happened with a gun prosecutors can threaten to add those enhancements if they haven't already uh, in order to get the defendant to to take the deal and According to the Supreme Court so far, this is not a problem. Um, the few areas where the court has uh, given some uh, definition into, in terms of rights, the defendant has a right to be advised of the immigration consequences of their plea. Um, so that's Padilla v. Kentucky, that was in 2010, so 20, 10 years ago. Um, and then also, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Lafler and Fry, these were the, um, the later cases um, where defendant, the court held that defendants have a right to effective assistance counsel at the plea bargaining stage. So it wasn't until um, 2012 that the court held that. Um, up until then, it was, you know, arguably an open question whether there was that right to competent assistance of counsel at that stage of the criminal process, which, like I said, is the dominant stage. This is where most cases end. Um, so in Missouri v. Fry, um, the facts are pretty simple. The defense counsel uh, failed to convey a plea offer before the offer expired. So this is pretty common that prosecutors will make an offer and they'll say it's open until such and such a date or open until we have our preliminary hearing or we have our next court date. You know, they'll often put it or sometimes it's open for an hour right there are or 10 minutes you got 15 minutes to make a decision right there are often time uh, constraints on plea offers so in this the uh, defense lawyer failed to convey the offer and then and it expired and so instead of pleading out to the misdemeanor that had previously been offered the defendant pled out to a felony driving with a revoked license and was sentenced to three years instead of the misdemeanor sentence which would have been much less um, Laffler v. Cooper, so these were companion cases that came down on the same day, and in Laffler, the defendant was charged with assault with intent to commit murder. Um, there were some other charges too. Um, the victim was shot four times in the hip, the buttock, and the abdomen. Um, they were all below the waist. All the shots were below the waist, all four. And the defense counsel um, advised um, the client that there's no way the prosecution could establish intent to murder because all four shots were below the waist. So all of you, I think, have now had crim law, and I think you know that's like bad advice. Um, and in fact, not only the Supreme Court, but the courts below and both sides acknowledged that was bad advice. No one was arguing that that was fine advice. Um, the defendant was went to trial. He was convicted um, and sentenced um, to 185 to 360 months, which was compared to the plea deal that he turned down of 51 to 85 months. So um, where some of the charges would have been dismissed and he would have gotten a lot less time. Um, and the appeal was due to ineffective assistance of counsel um, during the plea bargaining stage. So the court held in both of these cases together that uh, there is a right to, uh, to competent assistance of counsel during the plea bargaining stage. But what were they thinking of in terms of what is the plea bargaining stage? So um, there, for those of us who study negotiation and, um, and learn about it, right, there's three basic stages to every negotiation, be it plea negotiation or otherwise. You prepare for the negotiation, you do the negotiation, and then when you're negotiating as a lawyer, you've got client counseling. These things don't work in the same, you know, a smooth sequential order like I've got them on this chart. You can go back and forth. So you may be preparing, start the negotiation, realize there's more information you need to get, go back to preparing. You may be counseling the client at the beginning and then at other stages um, along the way. The Supreme Court, though, was only focused on this final stage, which is client counseling. So far, they haven't taken a critical look 
um, and on what's happening in the preparation stage and whether there's competent assistance of counsel at that stage and what's happening during the negotiation, both in terms of competent assistance of counsel, does the lawyer have adequate negotiation skills, but also they're not, they have yet to look critically at prosecutorial behavior during plea uh, bargaining. So now let's talk about how does all this basic background in plea bargaining play into COVID-19. Um, there are concerns in the, this current era that we're in about how effectively defense counsel can prepare for negotiation. Uh, there are questions how effectively prosecutors are able to prepare for negotiation. What information do they have access to? Um, how are they accessing that information? The negotiation phase itself is happening in very different ways. There was always negotiation happening um, over the phone. I, it happens via text message, um, but the fact that it's being forced into all these electronic mediums uh, now, much more so, uh, does change what's going on and leads to a variety of, of questions. And then there are very serious issues about how client counseling is happening uh, during this era, particularly for clients who are in custody. Um, so these are the basic uh, categories of things where there's a problem and I'm going to walk through and things to just be aware of that may be coming up. Um, I actually would be surprised if there's much uh, specifically about plea bargaining and anything that you're finding uh, because it is so often not spoken of um, in official rules. Um, but um, so the basic categories that we'll be talking about attorney client communication, discovery and inability to investigate, delays in plea offers, uh, delays in change of pleas um, in court, delays in trials, um, the basic category of coercion, um, and then the whole big category of hard bargaining tactics. Okay, so let's start. Attorney to client communication. So basic rule, defendants have a right to communicate confidentially with their lawyer um, and to have adequate communications with their lawyers. On a good day in court, this sometimes can be a problem. Um, on the less serious cases, there are all kinds of concerns pre-COVID about how much communication uh, lawyers are having with their clients and also in some more serious cases. But there's concerns, say misdemeanors, that uh, defendants are not really getting much of an opportunity to communicate with their clients before being uh, put in a position where they have to make a decision. Um, but in the COVID era, there's additional problems with it. Um, jails may be closed, they may be restricted access, even for lawyers uh, getting into the jails. There uh, may be defendants who are COVID positive. They may be denied any kind of visitors and any kind of communication. They may be housed in different parts of the jail for those that are in custody. Uh, and obviously there's different issues for those who might be out of custody and, and COVID positive. Um, electronic communication may not be confidential. This is a serious concern all over the country. I've heard reports from defense lawyers in a variety of places that they worry, they've always worried that if they do any of the kind of um, video link communications that these really are not being protected. There have been um, instances where it's been clear it has not been protected, that these are in fact being listened to um, by jail personnel or others. Uh, and this becomes even more of a problem if there's no other option, if the only option for communication is doing it through these electronic means and there's serious concerns about whether or not they're confidential. Um, another concern may be that things are being even more rushed um, and cutting down for time and communication when communication is already more challenging. Uh, it seems that there are courts uh, I think just about every court in the country right now is overloaded. Um, they were not hearing cases, not processing cases in the same way. Even with the reduction in arrests, there's still here serious issues, I think, in, in just about every court. Um, and a big push, um, and I'm hearing different kind of reports from different places about how much pressure is being put on both prosecutors and defense lawyers to move the cases and to plead them out and get them going, which on a good day in any criminal court, it's always rushed. Uh, and so the concern is it may be even more rushed with even less opportunity um, for discussion uh, in the era of COVID. Um, and then there's the reality that a lot of uh, defendants need interpreters to talk uh, with their lawyers. They speak another language, they may speak sign language. I had a number of clients over the years who spoke sign language. Um, and getting access to interpreters and how that's working uh, is also another area of concern. Um, 
And one of the other areas which I've heard lots of, um, kind of concerns expressed by lawyers is, let's say the defendant decides to plead guilty. Generally what happens is the lawyer sitting right next to their client. Their client has questions about something as they're going through uh, changing their plea in court. The client bends over to the lawyer and whispers in their ear. That's no longer possible when the lawyer is sitting someplace entirely separate from where the defendant is sitting. Um, so there's concerns about it if cases go to trial, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the bigger concern is what's happening um, as pleas are being taken and with some of the other hearings that are going on right now in courts around the country where clients really don't have an easy way to communicate with their, with, uh, their lawyer in a confidential manner. Um, so discovery, uh, basic rule is defendants have a right to exculpatory information. This was Brady v. Maryland. Um, Few states have more comprehensive laws. So here in Texas, we have a much more comprehensive law. It's called the Michael Morton Law, which came out of um, an exoneration um, where Michael Morton had been convicted of murdering his wife. He served 25 years in a Texas prison before being exonerated. Someone else did it. They found the other person um, who had actually murdered someone else, another woman in very similar circumstances, after killing Michael Morton's uh, wife. But one of the serious issues in the case was that the prosecutor had failed to turn over a couple of key pieces of information. That led to the change in law here in Texas. Um, New York just um, enacted a much more comprehensive discovery law, um, which went into effect in uh, just January 2020. So I haven't heard reports yet of how well it's working or not, particularly since a lot of it's been happening post-COVID. Um, so in states that don't have these comprehensive laws, it really comes down to, is it exculpatory information that's being withheld? If not, there may not be a right to it, there may not be access to it, and the access can be incredibly varied um, across, within states um, and between states. Um, and in this era, it may be even harder to get some of the basic discovery if things were not already set up for electronic delivery. So here in Tarrant County, there was an electronic discovery system that had been set up years before. Um, so things are working pretty smoothly as smoothly as they worked before because it's the same system. Um, in places where they didn't have that in place, you may see much more serious issues in terms of uh, when the defense is getting discovery from the prosecution, when the, how they're getting continuing discovery as prosecution may find more information. So these may be more serious issues um, in some places. Another concern is the inability to investigate, and this can be for both prosecution and defense. Um, so stay-at-home orders um, can complicate ongoing investigations, can make it harder for um, investigators to find uh, witnesses, to find uh, people to be able to interview them. It may make them less willing to be interviewed uh, by someone in person. Uh, people may or may not have access to electronics uh, that make communication easier, but there's serious concerns about the qualitative difference between sitting in a room with someone and asking them questions and doing it over a form like Zoom or FaceTime or something. Um, it may be harder to get um, additional information. So there's a lot now of um, footage from the cameras that police officers wear, how that's being turned over to the defense um, and how it's even being processed and managed by the prosecution may be much harder now. If they didn't have a system that they can uh, translate into a distance system, if they have to actually physically be in the office to review the footage, it can be much more challenging now as offices have been closed um, or limited hours or limited people. Um, and the failure to investigate could give rise to incompetent assistance of counsel claims. I think these are going to be interesting, particularly if the reason for the failure is the pandemic. Uh, how that gets looked at by the courts um, is an open question. Um, okay, one of the things we certainly know is going on right now is there's huge delays um, in our uh, courts and our criminal courts around the country. Um, courts shut down. Uh, I've heard some uh, refer to them as COVID vacations, that a lot of the courts just shut down. They were doing nothing um, for a month, six weeks, and just thinking then they're going to open up and be business as usual. They really weren't seeing the writing on the wall in terms of what this was going to look like and that it was going to be more extended. 
Um, so there's backlogs in a lot of courts, even the courts that were trying to figure out how to manage things uh, through distance, um, still uh, it's hard, it's more time consuming, they have a hard time keeping up. Um, so there've been delays. There's also been a lot of confusion about when cases are being heard, how they're being heard. I know I've seen communication on defense lawyer listservs where they're just trying to figure out what courts are open, what's happening, what are they supposed to expect? They're not getting notified by court clerks about when their cases are gonna be called, when they've been put over. So there's a lot of confusion and how confused it is varies from place to place and how well they were really positioned to, uh, to set things up in a time of emergency. So for example, I've heard um, the federal courts in some places like New York um, were already set up having been through prior emergencies. So they had a smoother transition online than some of the state courts um, have. Um, and I'm also not sure how across the board it is with the federal courts. Um, Okay, so there can be delays also in just a defendant decides they want to plead guilty. The offer is fine. It's one they want to take. Um, when can they get into court to do it? So there's the challenge I just said about the erratic court schedules. Um, their courts may or may not be scheduling hearings. It may be hard to figure out when, where, and how to get in front of the court. Um, what if the defendant has COVID? Um, I know that that's happened here in Tarrant County. There was at least one defendant who wanted to plead guilty, um, was positive for COVID-19, was being isolated in the local county jail, um, wasn't being brought to court, and where he was in the jail was not a place where they could bring in electronics that they had. Um, because of limitations in what they had available. Um, so this defendant who had a time served deal was sitting um, ill with COVID in a county jail, unable to enter his plea, which would have allowed him to be released um, to uh, at least go home or to seek um, medical treatment outside of the jail setting. Um, and we have no idea how many defendants may be caught in this situation right now. Um, what if the defense lawyer is ill? We know that there have been defense lawyers who have died from COVID since this started. Um, I have no idea how many might be ill with COVID um, and whether that's creating delays and how cases are being handled and managed. Same with prosecutors. Um, we just have no um, information um, about this. Um, and then there's alternatives. So in Virtually every court around the country, there's things like drug courts and mental health courts and um, other things, um, the other ways for defendants to resolve their cases. Um, and it's very unclear what's going on with a lot of these courts. Are they admitting new people? It's hard enough for them to manage the people that they have in this era. Um, so it's something that uh, I think is going to be interesting to watch and see how this is getting managed and if defendants who are getting arrested during this era are just being denied these opportunities to go to these alternatives. Um, now there's the question of coercion. So this is always a very live question in plea bargaining, as I said, you know, early on. Um, there, one of the ways it routinely comes up is the defendant is in custody, they're offered time served. Um, if they reject the deal, they're gonna be held in custody for a trial. If they accept the deal, they're released that day. That's a very powerful type of coercion um, to get someone to uh, plead guilty. It's a coercion that has not been held to be a problem um, so far by any court. Um, it is even more of an issue in my view when we're in uh, situation of COVID-19 and when it is present in the jail facility where the defendant is being housed and they know it. Um, now there's also the question there's a lot of there's a failure to test in a lot of um, detention and um, prison facilities so there's also questions of how much do people know about what's really going on in a particular facility. Um, if a defendant's out of custody the concern is that they threaten it look you take this deal it's going to be probation time served no jail. Otherwise, you're going to go to prison to court to trial and ultimately you're looking at prison time with COVID. Um, that can be a powerful um, also um, alternative and defendants can be rightly concerned about accepting a deal that may leave them more vulnerable and open to um, contracting COVID. Um, and this is even more so if the defendants in a medically vulnerable group. Um, so where they are much more concerned about uh, if they get it, what the medical consequences might be. I think there's a really interesting question here, which um, I don't know if it will get litigated, but, you know, Brady, what the case I talked about earlier, held it's not a violation to threaten death if death is the legal punishment. 
but um, is if someone is medically vulnerable, if the prosecution knows it, and they probably would because the defense would probably say, you know, there's a particular danger in sending my client to prison right now because um, they have a heart condition or they're over 65 years old or whatever, you know, our current CDC guidelines are. Um, and if they go to this facility, and we know in certain facilities where they might get sent, there's higher rates of COVID, um, it's likely, it's more likely they're going to get it and that they're going to die from it. Um, that's not a legal punishment, right? The legal punishment is jail. There might be a legal punishment of the death penalty, but death through COVID is not a legal punishment. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting question uh, where there are cases where that was the basically the offer on the table. You take the deal and you don't go to, to jail or prison, or you uh, reject it and you're looking at jail or prison um, with COVID and being medically vulnerable. And one of the things we do know is that once COVID gets into a detention facility um, in, or jail, it's impossible um, to uh, fully protect the people there because of the way jails are set up. Um, okay, so there's a variety of hard bargaining tactics that are used routinely um, in plea bargaining um, and that are, so far, the courts have said are just fine. Um, so exploding offers, things like, you know, if you don't take it now, it's going to turn into, into something else. The threats to add enhancements, which I talked about, the threats to add additional charges, which I talked about, the take it or leave it offers, right? So you don't, there's not going to be any negotiation. It's this or it's nothing. Um, and it doesn't matter what information you provide as a defense lawyer to the prosecutor, the prosecutor is not going to even entertain it. This is it. No, not open for discussion. Um, and then the threats to seek the death penalty. Um, I think there's a, now a new hard bargaining tactic, which is threats of incarceration during COVID-19. Um, and it's very unclear how much that's going on. Um, there are certainly jurisdictions that have made efforts and have stated priorities to decrease who's coming into the jails, um, to release people from the local jails. How much that's going on varies greatly from place to place. Okay, and then delays in trials. Now, why does this matter in plea bargaining? Um, in plea bargaining, the fact that there is a trial date can be a pressure point um, to get a different deal, to get from the defense perspective a better deal, um, and to get the case resolved. So it's a deadline. It's a, and in many jurisdictions, it's a hard deadline. There's you know firm dates by which a case has to, to be resolved um, by trial or by plea. Um, and this puts pressure on everyone in the system and can make the deals better. And I know when I was practicing in Los Angeles, if you had a last day for trial that was the last day for trial for a whole lot of other cases, the deals got better because there weren't enough courtrooms to try all these cases. Um, and so it, it can be a pressure point when the prosecution's not offering from the defense perspective what they think the case is worth. That's absent right now um, because there are essentially no trials um, being set and there's lots of discussion about when, where, and how trials are going to be restarted. There have been a few kind of pockets of trials happening, but um, I've only seen a few reports of a few trials around the country. So essentially in most jurisdictions, trials have been put off. Um, I know here in Texas, um, they've been put off again um, for a, a date that they shouldn't be happening. I think it's before September, might be August. Um, so, and that's happening around the country. So it takes a pressure point off um, in terms of uh, plea bargaining. Um, sometimes though, this works to the defense advantage, right? The older a case gets, it can work to the defense advantage, maybe harder for the prosecution to actually try it. So this is another reason that prosecutors may also want to try and move cases because they don't want to lose them um, entirely. Um, it's in my view, unlikely that speedy trial rights are going to be a barrier to these delays. Um, states of emergency have been declared. I know in previous times when judicial states of emergency are declared, all the speedy trial rights are just frozen. Um, so I think it's unlikely that there's going to be pressure um, because of statutory um, or speedy trial rights. Now, I think it's an issue when it gets to be a long period of time. And I know that there are already cases where people have been waiting for trial for already a long period because they're serious cases, they're murder cases. Those tend to take a while before they go to trial. And then they've been um, delayed even further. I think those are going to be, there's going to be litigation around that. And it's going to be interesting to see where that comes out. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, 
you know, end end with this. Um, I don't know if any of you saw uh, this the coverage. Um, this is criminal defense lawyer Samuel J. Rabin Jr. Um, this was how he dressed to appear in court in uh, Miami in federal court for a sentencing hearing just recently. Um, now Miami's, I think everyone knows, has been one of the hot spots, the current hot spots for COVID. Um, so, um, and I think you know, on the one hand, it, you know, there's something humorous about it, right? But on the other hand. Um, if this is your lawyer and you're talking to him, um, that's a challenge, right? To have these communications through all this gear. Um, I think there's questions about what kind of um, attorney-client relationships are being built um, and can be built and what kind of information clients are going to be feeling comfortable to give lawyers um, during this time and what kinds of negotiation is going on. Um, this was obviously just a sentencing hearing. It wasn't one where there was going to have to be long conversation and I would assume that the lawyer had already had all those conversations with their with their client. But um, but this, you know, I think does lead to the question of how much more of this are we going to see um, in courts and how is it going to be looking um, as this goes on and on. Um, okay, what what would you like to know? I have a question. Yes. Um, so obviously things have become extremely complicated with COVID, but prior to COVID, um, did you generally have like a weariness as a, a defense attorney to even bring up uh, to your client a plea bargain or is it like a case by case thing or is it just, you know, sometimes you just got to do it? Um, so as a defense lawyer, I think it's your obligation to bring to your client uh, any plea offer. Obviously that's, you know, court said that too. Um, and because this is how most cases are resolved, I mean, 92 to 95% of cases, there's no uh, criminal defense lawyer out there that's trying all their cases. Now those are, focus in on death um, cases are certainly trying the vast majority of them, right? But short of having a death only caseload, um, this is routine, right? Um, and for the most part, this is where you're able to do things for your clients is in the plea negotiation process. Um, trials are often very risky, particularly if you're talking about more serious cases with more serious time. Um, where there's a serious penalty. It's, I didn't have time to go into it here, but there's the trial penalty, right? So there's already good data that says that if someone um, goes to trial, they're going to be getting significantly more time than if they took the plea deal. Um, and I think the data out there hasn't taken into account the charge bargaining that goes on. So I think the trial penalty is actually probably much higher than what we routinely think it is. And the data says it's about 400 times more um, is what people are getting four times more the the sentence so um, so this is you know the trial penalty already significant as we understand it from from the data so when you're a defense lawyer uh, you know this and I think every defense lawyer has had the experience of going to trial and losing and having a client get slammed and getting a lot of time on something where they've been offered much less time before and really the only difference between these um, potential sentences is a trial, exercising a constitutional right to trial. It was, there was nothing else that changed along the way. Um, and so knowing that, um, I think there is an obligation to make sure that you're conveying to um, all clients what the, what the deal is. Now, I think there's an interesting question when the client says to you, I ain't taking no deals, which I've had plenty say that to me. Um, does that mean you shouldn't negotiate, that you shouldn't ask um, the prosecutor? And my view is no, I think you still have an obligation. Um, and plenty of my clients who said a version of I ain't taking no deals took a deal when push came to shove. Um, and so that says to me that this may be what they're thinking right now, but they don't have full information. Um, this is part of the job of a lawyer, right, is to make sure that your client really understands what's going on um, as best as they can um, and as best as you can convey it to them, right? Um, and so once they have a better understanding of what's going on and there's a plea offer on the table, uh, then uh, the, they can make an informed decision. And I think that's what's important from um, a defendant's point of view is that they're making is an informed decision. So. Thank you. Other questions? I've got some commentary happening here that I think would be good. I, I would love to ask it as, I mean, make the comment and ask the question about it. Um, 
so we've ta we're talking about uh, client, uh, attorney client communication. But as we've noticed, as some of you guys have noticed probably in your research and as we've noticed generally in the, um, in the orders about closing courts and uh, cutting off jail access is that a lot of these, these decisions are made without communicating with defense attorneys or public defense offices. So what do you think is, gonna, is, is going to come out about the lack of communication from um, prosecutors offices, sheriffs and courts about uh, withholding information from defense attorneys, say about the status of um, COVID positive court personnel or COVID positive um, people in, in the jails or just generally the lack of communication or even the deliberate uh, obfuscation of communication to defense attorneys about um, what's happening in the rest of the system. There's a rage I've seen um, amongst the defense bar, which I think is not misplaced um, because of this issue, right? There are um, lawyers have found out after the fact that they have been um, around someone who's been COVID positive. Um, there, some of the initial setups in some counties that I've heard of uh, were that the lawyer was supposed to go to the jail and be with their client in the jail transmitting electronically back to the courtroom where the prosecutor and the judge sat in relative safety um, while the defense lawyer was supposed to be in the jail, which these are COVID hotspots um, around the country. Um, and there's very serious questions about, you know, were people being provided masks? I mean, the, I think this is pretty much passed, but there were, oh, there was a whole period that um, for inmates to wear masks was a violation. Um, they were prevented from wearing masks. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't heard about that in the last week or two, so I'm hoping that that's no longer a, a live issue. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very real issue, and I think there's going to be questions. I mean, certainly, we know defense lawyers have gotten COVID-19, just as we know um, a whole lot of uh, defendants and, um, and those who've already been convicted, um, you know, who are sitting in, in prisons have gotten it. Um, I haven't heard yet of a prosecutor getting it, um, and that may just be my lack of knowing. Um, and judges, I, you know, one of the local Tarrant County judges got COVID, but at a conference, um, not in the, in the courtroom. Um, but judges are taking very different precautions, right? And I think this is one of the things, too, um, how seriously a particular judge is taking things and whether or not they're listening to the defense lawyers and the prosecutors in their courtroom. I know there was one county in Texas where, but for a statewide order to stop trials, he was ready to do a trial. As business as usual, no masks, no social distancing, nothing. Um, and the only thing that stopped it was a statewide order. Um, so I think these are serious issues. I think there's going to be um, a whole lot of serious litigation coming out of it. Um, and, and I think it also probably in places where this has been happening more, it speaks to what the existing culture has already been, right? That the defense bar has really not had the same voice uh, and the same uh, power as uh, the prosecution and the, and the judiciary. And so uh, it's you know, COVID, I think, in all areas is really just exposing what we already knew and saw as problems in our society. And this is no exception to that. So I don't know. Did that answer it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Other questions? I had a question. Um, the last slide that you showed with the attorney wearing that suit, um, I'm curious about how that kind of intersects with sort of like respectability politics like whenever you have a client who clearly does not have the freedom or like the capacity to you know really practice social distancing or have any sort of means of protecting themselves from um, becoming infected an attorney showing up dressed like this even if it's for like a brief moment I think that that kind of really establishes like the power dynamic between the attorney and the client and that very much, I don't know if I was a defendant or someone in a position where I needed someone's assistance and they showed up like this, I would be kind of cautious and I would be worried about how much they're actually invested in my well-being whenever they're clearly dressed, you know, to, I guess, just support their own wellness. Yeah, I think these are serious questions. Um, I don't 
you know, I don't have great answers to them. Um, I think it's a serious question. If everyone's showing up in hazmat suits, um, you know, defendants, prosecutors, judges, if everyone's dressed like this, that's one thing, right? But if it's, you know, as, as you say, it's only some, right? And it's a product of privilege. Now, um, I think, as I understand this story, a little bit of what was going on is that the, uh, the defendant was coming out of a detention facility with active COVID. I don't know how old this lawyer is, what this lawyer's health conditions are, and what the concerns might be. Um, it's a very serious issue that a lot of lawyers who are practicing in the criminal system, both prosecutors and defense lawyers, and a huge, I think a much larger percent of judges are in risk groups for COVID-19. Um, they're, they're in high risk categories. And so thinking about how you do trials or, you know, ultimately, right? Because I don't, assuming we don't have a vaccine for another year or so, I don't think they can just keep pushing trials down the road. Um, how's that going to look? How does it look for the regular client communication? Uh, in this era, the best communication in terms of being able to see someone's face and really talk human to human is probably electronically. Once people are going into the jail, um, they're going to be masked up. Um, there's a limit of what you're going to be able to see um, from them. Um, as we know, a huge percentage of communication happens non-verbally, uh, which is cut out um, when you are on these electronic mediums. And I think it's cut out in large part when you're dressed like you know, this and, you know, your full hazmat suit, or even just wearing a mask. Um, there are serious questions about um, witnesses testifying in masks or not in masks and lawyers being in masks or not in masks in court, much less the defendant, like how's it going to look for a defendant to be in a mask? There's already issues and any lawyer, you know, who's defense lawyer who's taken a client to trial knows you talk about how they're going to be dressed, right? That matters. You want, the, you know, to try and have a certain look so that the jury's not already assuming, although we know there's lots of studies that say that they come to very quick conclusions about criminal defendants. Um, but, you know, I think these are really serious questions. I think there are very, very serious questions about the entire attorney-client relationship during this era. Um, when you've got uh, defendants being housed in places that are unsafe to them, um, and that are unsafe for their lawyers coming in, how long is a lawyer going to want to spend in a, a jail having interviews? I know when I was a defense lawyer in LA, I would often go out to the jail and spend an entire day or afternoon um, talking to clients um, one after the other. Um, in the age of COVID, would I want to do that? No, I wouldn't. Um, do I? And then the question is, do you trust the electronic communication forms? Serious issues there. Right. So I think there's a lot of really serious questions and, you know, this, you know, how how people are attired um, for their own safety and protection. Um, it's got the other the flip side to it, as you pointed out. Right. How does that look and how does it and what kind of relationship can you build between people um, because of how that looks? So you just briefly mentioned this, but it's also uh, in it's also in the chat as a question: is how do you feel about situations where lawyers are only able to speak to their clients on the phone, but phone use in jails are being conditioned upon a waiver of privacy? So you briefly mentioned that it's a, yeah. that you know do you trust it? But what are the issues for people who haven't taken procedural courses or who haven't quite thought out the collateral consequences of waiving your privacy yeah. in a jail? So. I, <sighs> One of the, I think, fundamentals of the attorney-client relationship is that of confidentiality, that everything that a client says to their lawyer in civil and criminal contexts is confidential, um, and that that should not be something um, that others are privy to, and of course, the lawyer should never um, divulge confidential information. Um, and when you're talking about a client who is being detained, they cannot control the environment in which they are having conversations with their lawyer. It's up to those who are uh, doing the detaining to control and to ensure that the rights are being protected. Um, and it's a serious issue when uh, phone calls are being routinely recorded um, 
and potentially could be looked to. There have been instances where prosecutors have gotten transcripts of conversations between defense lawyers and their clients, which should be something that they never get access to, but it's happened. Um, and in, you know, it kind of also goes to the, this last question about the attorney-client relationship, right? The, in order to have a meaningful attorney-client relationship and in order to give uh, good advice, the lawyer needs to have the client, one, be comfortable with them, but two, give them information. Um, and oftentimes clients are giving information that does not help their case. And this is helpful for the defense lawyer in terms of understanding what's the real situation going on here? What are the potential risks that this client is facing? Um, so for example, when I was practicing law in Los Angeles, it was in the era of three strikes and the, um, where the third strike could be a simple petty theft or possession of crack cocaine. I had those cases where someone was looking at 25 to life for um, something very minor. That's The law has now been changed so that that is no longer how it works, but for many, many years, that's how it worked. Um, and what that meant is when I had a client who had one strike on their case, when I went in to talk with them, often my first question was to really try and dive into what's your prior record? What other cases do you have out there? Because the initial information that prosecutors had uh, was not always complete, particularly there were out-of-state priors. Out-of-state priors can be used just as well as in-state. They just sometimes don't come as quickly. Um, and so I have cases where defendants would tell me um, about other cases and I'd be like, okay, so this offer that may not sound so good on its face, now you've just told me that you have another strike out there. So instead of 25 to life, you can take this eight year deal and it's, you will get out much sooner, right? Um, so, you know, getting that information matters. Now, if I thought when I was having that conversation, it was being recorded, I don't know what questions I would even ask because I would be worried that I would be handing on a silver platter uh, to the prosecution information that they shouldn't have, you know, that they have to work for, right? We have an adversarial system and prosecution is supposed to do their job. I'm not supposed to do their job for them as a defense lawyer. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think the lack of confidentiality um, prevents information from being given um, and co can completely color what's going on. And it's, and it's a serious, serious issue right now. Uh, and it's happening around the country in a variety of ways. And I think it is impacting in, in a serious way what uh, lawyers are doing, are, are doing and are able to do um, for their clients. I don't know, did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Before I ask another, are there any more students or uh, lawyers on the line who wanna ask questions? Okay, then I have another one. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that one of the, um, that there is also a delay in investigations. Um, and real, real life example is the um, Houston Forensic, the Forensic Science Center in Houston, uh, their independent evidence lab. A good portion of their investigators are out either for quarantining or because they've been exposed. And so it puts their cases behind. So what happens during plea bargaining typically is that clients are admonished that if they accept the plea that they can't litigate um, or they can't appeal the order. So if you accept a plea bargain, if it be just timing, you know, your case, uh, you want to get out of jail, your case can't be investigated, so you, can't, you don't think that you can be... Um, you can be freed via Morton rules or via investigation because you're aware that investigations are slowed down or stopped. Um, do you think that there could be an interesting constitutional challenge to taking a plea bargain during this time uh, simply because you knew you could go home if you took the plea bargain, but you know you took it because you knew your case couldn't be investigated? Do you think that that's going to be a constitutional issue that can be open during this time. Typically it's not because, you know, that's what plea bargaining is meant to prevent. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it creates a lot of challenges, right? Because um, plea waivers against appealing a plea bargain are standard in a lot of places. 
And in this era, I think a defense lawyer is saying, look, we'll only take pleas um, if you take that out, that you allow a later um, appeal, is probably going to go nowhere. Uh, prosecution will probably say, fine, then don't plead. Um, you know, they, a lot of them are conditioning um, it on that, and that's an important uh, part of the plea deal as far as they're concerned, and they have no particular incentive to lighten up on that. Um, it's also a problem because there's not a lot of protection written into the law. I haven't looked at the, the New York law for this issue, but here in Texas, the Michael Morton law, prosecutors are under an ongoing obligation to turn over um, information. So if say, you know, the Houston Crime Lab then starts processing things and as they have in the past, they find that, wait a minute, this isn't actually a controlled substance. It's like, you know, talcum powder. Um, that if a case goes to trial, um, and the defendant's convicted, there's an ongoing obligation for the prosecutor when they find that information out to then turn it over to the defense. The law does not say that there's an ongoing obligation in a plea bargain situation. It specifically says trial. Um, it did not write in plea negotiations now and plea bargains. And you know, my thinking on that is that it's just because the legislature is not that aware of the reality that most cases plead out. And so this is why you see an absence, I think, oftentimes in law about any mention of plea bargaining, because there just isn't a good awareness that this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about our criminal legal system. It's how plea bargaining works. Um, I think there. I, I think it is an issue. I think it is um, a important um, issue to be litigated. Um, how successful they're going to be? I mean, I think this is a real challenge because I know in previous judicial emergencies, there's ten courts have tended to say, well, you know, everyone was doing the best they could. It was a judicial emergency. It's, you know, it's not going to be. They they haven't tended to. Um, take a hard line in terms of making sure that all rights are being protected. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it'll be curious here. I mean, I, I think in some ways it's maybe harder because the problem is not only nationwide, it's worldwide, right? I mean, this is something that's going on everywhere. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's, there's going to be serious questions about it. I would hope that there'll be litigation. I mean, I think the concern is with a lot of the cases that played out um, in the crime lab, are they even going to process stuff once the case is put out? Um, so, so we may never know um, on a whole lot of these cases if there actually was a problem and there actually wasn't um, the evidence that they needed to support a conviction. I could go on, but if there are other questions. I'm going to take the silence as there are no other questions. <laughs> Um, and I don't see anything in the chat. This was incredibly interesting. I, 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 like Cynthia, can keep asking questions and keep talking all day. But um, I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, thank you all for being engaged and asking questions. And thinking about this as you uh, do your research. I want you guys to keep this in mind as you're looking at what's happening in the court processes, what's happening in the jail, what happens with defense providers, and all of this. And for those of you who are thinking about uh, taking the extra step and possibly writing about hot topics about what you're seeing or trying to uh, publish a piece or think about a research portion of what you're looking at, uh, I would think about some of these issues that Professor Alcum brought up about the constitutional issues that may come up about potential litigation and thinking about the consequences for all the players in the system. What happens uh, when defense attorneys aren't um, consulted about some of these decision, decisions? What happens when they're deliberately kept in the dark? What happens with clients? What happens generally to the entire court system. As Professor Alcon mentioned, this is going on worldwide. So what we discuss here, or what we think about here, has implications for the rest of this country, and it has implications for the world. People are looking for, for ways to navigate around these issues, and it's novel. Um, it's novel for all of us, but it's novel if we can start thinking outside the box about um, how our criminal legal system ought to function in the future against this. Once we start, should we go back to business as usual? Are there, um, are there processes that we figured out during this process that work better in the future? The, since everything, since there are so many issues coming up now, that's the biggest argument you have for, for making changes or making significant changes to the way we do criminal justice in this country. It's not going away anytime soon, I don't think. And 
there's a possibility of disasters. This isn't the first, this is the first national disaster, but there are plenty of jurisdictions across the country that have had to halt and stop and halt and stop due to natural disasters. So I want you guys to think about that kind of stuff. Go for it. Yeah, if I could just add one more thing, which is um, that, you know, um, and my email address is on the first slide. Um, so if you've got questions, if you decide you're going to, you know, try and write a paper on something relating to plea bargaining, I am absolutely happy to help out. Um, you know, I think this is endlessly interesting stuff and I would love to, um, to you know, help out where, uh, where I can. Um, and the other thing is, is if you see things, um, stories, news items, other things that, you know, may or may not fit firmly into this um, the research you're doing for this project, but are on point in terms of how plea negotiations, plea bargaining is happening in this era. I would love it if you could send me that um, because of some of the research that I'm doing, that would be hugely helpful. And I would love you um, keeping an eye out for that, including just if you hear a story from you know, local uh, defense lawyers or prosecutors that you know and are talking to um, during this, this era, I, I'd love um, any and all of those tidbits, so. Once again, thank you guys.